Well, let's declare, I am ready for new wine. For new wine. For new wine. Lord, make me new wineskin. New wineskin. New wineskin. In Mark, Mark chapter 2, verse 22. Jesus said, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. New wineskins, new wine. Everything has to be new. So when Jesus spoke on the subject of old and new wineskins, He's referring to how God wants to break through old structures and mentalities. He wants to break through old mentalities. And people with old mentalities cannot contain the new wine. So say that, I want to contain the new wine. People with outdated mentalities cannot receive the new wine that God is wanting to pour out. And in these last days, God wants to pour out the Spirit. God wants to pour out the new wine. I mean, we've got to be, actually, we have to be end time conscious. And I've heard various points of view about that. Well, that's not very positive, and that's not very optimistic. And it could also be fearful. But I think it's very optimistic when the Bible says, lift up your eyes, for your redemption draws nigh. Amen. It's very, very optimistic when we, it, you know, if you spend your time, when you realise that the fake news, all of the, the news out there is completely fake news. Yeah. It's all yeah. fake news and it can appear that Satan and demons are so prevalent and running the show. But when we read the real news, the good news, yeah. we get the truth. Amen. 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 And we actually know that they are on the way out. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so it's very important to be conscious of the soon coming of Jesus so that we are ready. Amen. Amen. And it's that generation that are conscious of his soon coming, that are waiting upon him, that are going to receive the new wine. That are going to receive the outpoured Holy Spirit. It's not that we have to look on YouTube at loads of different videos about when's World War Three going to start and what's happening here and terrible things in the Middle East and Goodness me, I mean, India and Pakistan could blow up any moment. And things are happening all the time. I just saw, I, I, didn't, I didn't look at the news today. I don't recommend it, but I just happened to see a news feed on my phone about a plane crash this morning. Addis Ababa to Nairobi. And it's, I've, I haven't flown that route, but I've, flo I've flown into Nairobi quite a few times. And I've just felt that that's, that's 157 people who this morning weren't, Probably expecting to step into eternity. And it can feel grim. But you know what? The real news is we lift up our eyes and see. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. And this is not a defeatist thing like we just quit. And we just find a little hole in the ground to hide it until Jesus comes. Because he says, when I come, will I find faith? Mm -hmm. And he's looking to pour out new wine in an end time generation church. Amen. Praise God. And so he's not minding, he's not, God is not mending the old wineskins. He's completely replacing them. He's replacing them. And he wants to bring deep transformation to the church. Now you'll know the scripture in, I think it's in Matthew 28, it's okay, you don't have to turn it with Ben right now. And it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that in the original language means go into every sphere of life. And bring the power of the gospel. So I mean the realm of education, culture, theatre, sports, politics, economics, government, business. And in that, wherever you are, and you might think, well, I'm not an influential person. I just work in a, I just, I just right now, I'm, you, you know, some of my mates were thinking, yeah, and I'm just working at McDonald's. And that's not very influential. But if we carry the fullness of the spirit and the new wine and people there get saved, that's pretty influential. Yeah. I just read something yesterday. I think it was some guy who led Dale Moody to the Lord, who then led someone else to the Lord, who then led someone else to the Lord, who then led Billy Graham to the Lord. So the original guy who just led one person to the Lord is pretty influential. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Say, I can have influence. I, can have influence. I, have influence. I have influence. You have it. Amen. 
And so, the, the, with the new wine, we are to rule in the Spirit. Say, rule in the Spirit. Rule in the spirit. Say it like a minute. We don't say, rule in the Spirit. They rule. rule in the Spirit. This is when the British Army, bless them, want to go and invade a country they don't go, well, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> you know, John, like, you know, people join nutcases, join the parachute regiment and things like that, and they don't go, they, they, they don't go, well, I'm joining, I'm joining, I want the red beret or the green beret. I hope I never have to go to war. They want to! And then if they get called up, it's like, well, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> They're already defeated. They're like, yeah, we're going. We're going to take over. We're going to Get rid of the enemy. We're going to rule. So we have to decide to rule in the spirit. Whoever here feels an oppression come on you? Who's ever felt that this week? So we have to choose to rule in the spirit. And look, you we might be, some of us, in a humble position. You might be listening to this thinking, well, I've got to go to that McDonald's drive through tomorrow. And that might feel pretty tough. And some of the people that you work with there or whatever, you might be working somewhere else. And there's some pretty interesting characters and just being around them feels oppressive well we're gonna as a church rule in the spirit you are going to rule in the realm of the spirit so that when you go into that place things start lining up for you Amen. and people will start getting saved and you know some people might have to get fired and get moved out Amen. out of the way Amen. as i give a little testimony once my dad who's now retired was working in this company and you always get tensions between employees, that's normal. But there was something I realised was going on which was abnormal. My dad had become a union rep and there was all kinds of strife and horrible things and he's, he's a good man. And I could see it was affecting his health. There was one particular character in the company who was really unjust, really, really bad person. I'm not judging them, but it's their actions. And my mum was getting really worried about his health and what it was going to do to him. And the Lord, I prayed about it, I prayed in tongues and the Lord said, this person sent by the enemy to destroy your dad. And so I took authority over it in the name of Jesus. And the guy was fired within a week. Amen. Amen. Somebody's got to do things like that. You're going to rule in the spirit. I'm not saying do witchcraft over people. Okay. I'm not saying please hear me properly. You're going to rule in the spirit. So that you can penetrate your spheres among your relatives. Who's ever been to family gatherings as a, as a Christian and you feel like. You, you might as well be from a different planet. Yeah. You felt like that. It's like, it's like having a picnic in the middle of the M1, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That awkward feeling when you're around natural family who are not just not saved, but they clearly want you to feel that you're odd. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had relatives, I'll not say who it is, will come to our home and for a kid's birthday, walk in our, our home and go, hmm. <laughs> Ignore us and then on the way out go, hmm. <laughs> right, okay then. And there's an oppression and you go to a family gathering and you feel that oppression. Can anyone identify with that? And like I said, it's like I'm a picnic in the middle of the M1 and you can think, you can feel condemned. I'm not supposed to be this supercharged Christian who everybody likes and full of charisma. And right now I'm just sort of sat there like, when everyone's getting hammered and I'm not, obviously, because I'm not, just, it's not me. When we rule in the spirit, things start changing. Because it's, we're not fighting flesh and blood. We're never fighting flesh and blood. When the yokes and burdens come off us, where we go, we carry this atmosphere. I remember years ago, we went, actually went to another family gathering once it was. And, and, and we just carried the joy of the Lord. I remember that particular time. And just among relatives, just sat there, just witnessing all among, just sharing Jesus amongst them. Like we didn't care. Why? Because we went in that particular occasion completely free, ruling in the spirit. So we're going to rule in the spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And this is what the pouring out the new wine, this is what the new wineskin is about, this is what the new mindset is about. It's, look, coming to church is really important. It really is important. This is an equipment centre. This is a place where we come and we're committed and make it happen and, and yokes and burdens get removed. And there's a, lot, there's a lot of thinking out there. Well, church is just wherever a few Christians get together. Okay, well, people think like that, and before they know it, there's nothing. And then you've just got scattered, broken, lonely people who are struggling. And people can struggle with, oh, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not into organized stuff. Well, fine, but it's like, it, you know, to be church, it takes commitment in making it happen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. look, there's only one reason... If, if I'm not here on a Sunday, it's because I've been raptured. 
then you are, I'll pray for you. <laughs> or, um, you know, we're somewhere else. I, we, we, you know, God sent us somewhere else. I don't know. We, we, it's just, it takes commitment. It takes consistency. And yet the benefits, but, you know, church coming together is, I'm saying, having a central hope is just, we'll, we'll never deviate from the importance of that by coming under the ministry of the word, by corporate worship. Well, I can worship on my own. I can just put YouTube on or whatever. I can worship on my own. No, there's something better and different when we worship together. Amen. Amen. Well, and, people, and people can be, well, at home, I can put preaching on YouTube. Well, well, yeah, but you listen. we can listen to so many different messages and none of it becomes revelation and Galatians 5. If that's not where we saw, amen, amen. we're actually reaping according to the flesh. The Bible says that where you talk, that's where you put your tithe, yeah. that's where you put your seed. Amen. Now, if anyone's hearing that thing, Pastor Scott's saying, I mustn't listen to anybody else. I mustn't listen to this. But no, I'm not saying that. But we have to have a central home. I mean, we have to have a main food storage place. We have to have a main place to come. And then it's back. You know, if you want to listen to something, that's fine. If you listen to crazy, heretical, balmy stuff, of, you know, we'll, we'll bless you and love you and just say, oh, okay, right. So, but anyway, we'll not go on more on that one. But what the point I want to get to, church is massively important. It is. And we'll never deviate from that. This is like the hope. But you know, each one of us is a minister of the Spirit. Hallelujah. We all have a pulpit 24-7. And God is changing His people so that we, out there, we are the church. Amen. We gather as the church. Amen. We have times when we get together as the church. But it's taken, it's penetrating the, the society out there. And if that is just a McDonald's drive through so what? Then we need to grow in our prayer and intercession. Come along Friday night, supernatural evangelism training, and then learn to pray for lost people. Amen. Pray for lost people. And you might think there's so many lost people. Where do I start? Just start with one or two. That's influence. Now this is Mark 16. Go on, Ben. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 18. It says, go into all the world, all the system. That word world means system. Go into all of the system and preach the gospel to every creature. That doesn't mean that the spiders and the cats and dogs. It just means to all the created order, the people that are in it. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, I'm not going to cover baptismal regeneration. Okay, the thief on the cross... The thief on the cross, few technicalities, wasn't able to get baptized. Okay? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Amen. He called on the name of the Lord. He repented. Is he saved? He wasn't baptized. He's not saved. <laughs> Look, slight technical problem there. He couldn't get baptized. But it's, it's baptism is a genuine heart response to salvation. It just follows. It's kind of like when I met the woman and, and I thought, She's the woman I'm going to marry. Amen. I mean, yeah, we had a courtship for a year or so. If I could have, I would have married her a week later. But I wasn't just going to let her hang around and be my girlfriend forever. Okay, yeah. yeah, we weren't going to live with each other and try before you buy. Yeah. It was like, this is the one. This is of God. We make a public declaration. That's what baptism is. Yeah. It's not having God as your girlfriend, boyfriend, sorry. <laughs> it's not just Jesus is my boyfriend. I hang out with him, he's nice. No, I'm getting baptised. It's the end of my old life. This is forever. It's like marriage in that sense, okay? Anyway, that's... Whoever who believes and is baptised will be saved. But those who do not believe will be condemned. Not very politically correct, Jesus. Not very loving of you, but it's the truth. Look, one of the, one of the motivations for evangelism is the fact, listen, unsaved people go to hell. Isn't that that's not fair? You saying people of other religions go to hell? Yeah, they do. Unsaved churchgoers go to hell, and it can seem grossly unfair. You know, listen. When we come to the subject of hell, and I'm not wanting to teach on hell today. Hell, in one sense, in some people's mind, is a bad image. It's an image problem for God. It's bad public relations. So maybe we should just adjust his public relations. Give him a new marketing makeover and make everything mega seeker sensitive. Never mention the fact that there's a hell. We don't celebrate hell. 
We're not like, yay, we're not going out with a big black King James Bible. Although I've got a King James Bible here. I really like it, it's great. Uh, we're not going out and banging people over the head with it. And we are wanting to show love and cordiality to people. But the fact is, hell's real. And when we look at hell, it's not about the injustice of God. It's about the sinfulness of human beings. The reason people go to hell is because they're sinners. Right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have lied. Every single one of us has lied. Jesus said, look, you want to take God's standards and commandments? Look at anyone with lust. You're an adulterer in your heart. Hit at anybody? You're a murderer in your heart. We're all guilty. And you could say, well, isn't it? It's not fair that God's not going to save them. He saved me. Hey, he doesn't owe you anything. Part of the aspect of God's grace is the fact that he owes nobody nothing. He's God. Well with it. He was well. He could have been well within his rights to say, like the angels that sinned, he cast them out of the darkness. No redemption for the angels that fell in sin. None. He would have been well within his rights to say the same thing about the human race. Absolutely. We always side with God, not with man. God is just. Let God be true and every man be a liar. So, there is an importance to evangelism. And people say, oh, that's really negative. Jesus spoke about it. Jesus spoke about hell a lot. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said, look, if I could take every person and dangle them over hell for oh, just five minutes, that would spur them on. And I will testify, this is the truth before God. I lie not. I got saved. I can't remember the exact day. But I got saved in the month of August 1996. And I remember vividly, around about the July of that year, about a month before I got saved, this was not a dream. This was not a dream. It wasn't sleep up in the air or anything like that. I was sat up in my bed reading. And all of a sudden, I was somewhere else in my future. Something like 20 years ahead. It felt like I was 20 years ahead in my future. I was conscious of still being me. And I was in a different place. I wasn't dreaming. I was completely conscious, as, as real as I am here. And I was full of indescribable pain, regret, shame and bitterness. And this sounds graphic, but I got up out of my bed. It was like in a, in a bed sit. I was a drug addict. I knew it. It's not like a voice said, no, you're a drug addict. You're in your future. This is the year. Da, da, da. I just knew it. And I walked out my room. And I walked up the stairs and somebody called my name and I collapsed and I went through the stairs into eternal darkness. And I came back to 1996 in a cold sweat. I saw myself. God let me see. The trajectory I was on was taking me to that place. And it wasn't good. And I never forgot that. And so I'm not ashamed to talk about these things, okay? So we are, we've got to have a burden for the lost. The vast, listen, I'm saying this, we might come to church and part of me saying, well, people need to have a positive message when they come to church. They might not come again because they, they might go down the road. Look, no, I'll say this, the vast majority of people in the United Kingdom who die go to hell. The vast, overwhelming majority of people in this city who died this past week are in hell. Because there's a, this is how bad things are in this land. Maybe in Africa or in other places, it's different. Less so. There's more problems there. There's, there's more humility. There's more openness to God. Even people in their last moments. There's more the gospel in you know, places like Nigeria and we have Kenya today. There's a lot more Christians. This is a country that's really hardened itself against God. The overwhelming majority, 99% maybe, of people who've died in this city in this past week, and there's a lot of them, are in hell now. <sighs> oh man, that's so heavy. But it's the truth. It's the truth. And God is not unjust. We're a nation that's had so many chances. We're a nation that's had chance after chance and we've turned our back on God. We're a nation. God delivered this nation in World War II. The nation prayed, deliver us. We were facing annihilation as a nation. Nazi invasion. God delivered this nation. And 
There has to be a revival in this nation. There has to be a revival. There has to be a move of God in this nation. This nation is in absolute peril. And one time in our past, this nation was going to slip into civil war, just like France did. And God saved this nation through revival, through the Methodists. And I think it was around about a quarter of the nation, something like that, got saved. A lot. It was an awesome revival. But Jesus says we've got to preach. The gospel has to be preached. I don't know about you, but that can feel intimidating. And I've done a lot of evangelism. I've done a lot of evangelism in my time. And look, I'm not even, I don't know why, I haven't even, I'm not even wanting to bring some high pressure message of you must go out and preach. That wasn't my plan for this morning. Really, it's not because we've got to have the new wine. I've done evangelism badly and I've done it good. I know when it's gone badly, I've gone out with no confidence, feeling rubbish. God still counts it faithful. But there's been times when I've gone out clothed in the power and the presence of God. And it's been absolutely wonderful and effortless. Wow. And just live, we can live like that. We have experienced just being in supermarkets before. Just It's just seamless. It's just, you don't have to force it. You've just got the spirit on you. And you just pray for the lady at the checkout and pray for her and share with her. Give her a gospel leaflet, whatever. It's, just, it's not hard when we live in the new wine. So please, if you're listening to this this morning, I haven't set you up for a high pressure message of feeling guilty if we don't share the gospel. But listen to the, the words of Jesus as he's commanding his followers. He, he, he does, he's quite real about it. He's black and white about the lost condition. But he says this, the only way the church can reach the world is in the power of God. He says, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Now, that means we're going to cast demons out of people, but it also means we're going to drive them out of places. Amen. You're going to drive them out of your workplace. Say, I'm going to drive the devil out of my workplace in Jesus' name. I'm going to drive it out of my business. I'm going to be there in the morning. I'm going to pray for that place, and I'm going to command that atmosphere to change in Jesus' name. I'm going to command that unclean atmosphere to change. I'm going to take authority because I work there and God has sent me there. It's my sphere. God has sent me in this sphere. The first thing I'm going to do is rule in the spirit and drive the devil out of that place in Jesus name. It's not literally saying you have to have a deliverance meeting in the workplace. You might have a problem with your HR department if you start doing that sort of thing. But you can drive the devil out of your workplace. You can take authority over that false religion in the name of Jesus and yes if there's a particular demonic person who's in an opposition like there was that guy on the island of Cyprus opposed Paul you can have the anointing to deal with that person in Jesus name maybe they need to go blind for a time maybe they need to be moved out but you can drive out demons out of your home you can, if you know you've got a family gathering coming up you can drive the devil in advance out of that in Jesus name you can do it. Amen. Because it's in his name. Amen. And it says, you're going to speak in new tongues. Amen. That means you, you're going to exercise the gift of the Spirit in you to keep yourself charged up in the Holy Ghost. It doesn't mean as you go preaching. It can mean this, and I've tried it before. If you do meet someone foreign who doesn't speak your language, you go and speak in tongues by faith, and they can understand you. That can happen. Okay? But this is also talking about you have a gift of the Spirit. You need to be clothed. You're going into hostile territory. I don't know about you as Christians. Let's be real. In the United Kingdom today, being a Christian is not cool. It's not socially acceptable. It's a shameful thing in the UK to be a Christian, isn't it? Do you feel it in the workplace? Do you feel it around people? But it's okay to be other religions, isn't it? It's okay to be anything else. But you say you're a Christian. Now why is that? There's a spirit of shame come on the church. And the reason it's come on the church in the land is because the church is not clothed with Holy Ghost power. The church is naked. Now listen, this is how the church is doing it. 
Christians are intimidated and Christians are scared. So they have their little huddles, their little holy huddles where they feel safe. And they make it really secret sensitive and really safe and non-offensive because they can feel safe there. And avoid conflict with the world. Avoid the discomfort of coming into conflict with the spirit of this world. I know how it feels, I don't like it. I'm not saying that we go into work and places like that and confront our colleagues who live ungodly lifestyle. The Bible says we're not to judge unbelievers, by the way. We're not to go in there judging them, we're to love them, and we're to give an answer for the hope that's within us. But there's a spirit, there's an antichrist spirit in the land. It just says, you Christians, stay in your little huddle over here, your little clique, and have your little Christian subculture. And if you do do anything for the world, well, the definition I read of Christianity last week on a, 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 some Leeds-based, faith-based website was Christianity is loving God. Amen. It's loving God. It's believing in Jesus. I agree. And it's helping make this world a better place. No, it's not. You can't help the Titanic become better. If you're on the Titanic, your job is not to get a plaster and try and stitch the hole up. Your job is to get people in the lifeboat, man. Because that ship is going down. We can't make the world a better place. The world is going down. The Bible says, I was reading in second verses, Second Peter, it talks about how the elements are going to burn with fire. We can't change that. Oh, well, that's not very positive. No, to get people out of this world and into the kingdom. And at some point that's going to be discomfort because we're going to have a clash with the spirit of the world. And yes, at times with the people. Although we don't initiate that, we're not to be rude with them. And so we must be clothed. This is why we need the gift of tongues. We shall drive out demons and speak in new tongues. That's not so you're going into your workplace tomorrow. I need this gift because it keeps the spirit of God clothing me. I need to be in the word and praying in tongues and praying in tongues so that when I'm going in places, the devil gets shoved out in my way. And people start asking me what's going on in my life. And then someone at my workplace has a bad back and I say, hey, I have a, I have a healing gift. So you have to say, hey, I have a healing gift. They say, all right, if I just put a hand on your back and pray. Yeah, yeah, sure. And you go, boom, I'm just going to pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for this person. I command this back. Be healed now. Right, bend over and check it. And they go, what are you doing? Oh, I'm there. Amen. What do you do? That's the God I serve. Amen. And pretty soon, news about that spreads all over your company. Amen. Amen. And then you're preaching the gospel. Which brings us up to the next point. It says you're going to take up serpents and if you drink anything deadly. Now listen, it's not one of those crazy backward redneck American churches where we get the rattlesnakes out. We're going to do that. Ronnie, you served in churches in America. Did you ever any mess about with any rattlesnakes? No, you didn't. Ronnie kind of looks and goes, no, I didn't. <laughs> we're, going to pass the, we're not going to pass the rattlesnakes out and drink the poison. This means that as you take the assignment of Jesus on your life, the devil is going to try and take you out. He's going to try things that will inject poison into you. He's going to try and set you up. And the Bible here promises, Jesus promises, if you take this assignment, you will know protection. Amen. Amen. You're going to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. People with cancer, because you're around, because you lay hands on them, they're getting healed. Look, this is New Testament Christianity. This is New Testament Christianity. Hello. Is it meant to be just the pastor and that's it? And everyone just sits down and goes, you know what I mean? Let's come and be entertained on a Sunday. But it starts at half ten, I'll go here. No, this is training. This is equipment. This is like a military camp. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now it sounds scary to people. But, you know, but family, we'll love one another. This is a place of equipment. <laughs> we are ministers of the Spirit. You are a minister of the Spirit. Paul says, my speech and my preaching were not with words of man's wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Pray for opportunities to demonstrate the spirit and power. Just simply to be able, Lord, set me up in a situation to lay hands on someone. Boom. Just there. Just do it. Just act like it works. There's a little key. Act like it works. Act like it works. Speak like it works. And guess what? It works. So look, God is wanting to bring change. He wants new wine 
We're in the end times. This is end time generation. He's looking for end time remnant churches. End time. And so we have an assignment. Now, in the war efforts, some are, yeah, like the front line and others, logistics, whatever. We're all playing a part in the warfare. We're not just wanting to create a holy little huddle. Okay? So there's, there's change. A lot of people are dissatisfied in their Christian life because they're not experiencing this. Because if you're born again, the spirit on the inside of you wants to go and cast out demons. Wants to go and preach the gospel with a demonstration of the spirit and the power. Wants to show that Jesus is strong. Amen. Amen. And wipe the shame. Not of Je There's no shame on Jesus. Wipe the shame that's associated with being a Christian in Britain today. Because of a compromised church that licks up to the world. Please give us your money. We'll do your charity work for you. Do you not realise, look, oh, I don't like being political. Do you, have you not realised how the government is killing the poor off? How many homeless there are on the streets? The government is slowly killing them all off. And people, all them with the messing up the benefits, just to slowly kill, kill. It's just all about killing the poor off. They don't care. And you know what? And the government's... <coughs> What they did years ago, they're not the support they're not doing now. Do you know who's doing it? Christians. It's the Christians. What costs the government that much? They just give a few crumbs and the Christians go and do it for them. And don't preach the gospel. God is bringing change. Okay. And for change, there's got to be a supernatural encounter and a dealing with God. Listen, I've said this before. We're, we're coming into alignment with King Jesus Ministries. That's not so that we are we lose our identity, who we are as a church. And not so that we join a denomination and become controlled. No. But there's, there's a DNA, and part of the DNA is winning souls. An apostolic movement. New wine. Got to carry the new wine. Hallelujah. When Jesus spoke these words about the new wine and the new wineskin, he was actually at the house of the tax collector Levi. And the Pharisees were opposing him at that time. Do you realise that? The religious will always try and contain the move of God. The religious spirit will always try and contain and limit the move of God. Or it makes a museum out of past moves of God. Or they become dead institutions. So new wine has to have a new wineskin. Now get this. How is a wineskin made? I mean we just, we read it in the Bible, wineskin. We see the word wineskin all over the place. How is it made? It's, best, it's very difficult to make a new wine, to make a wineskin. Obviously you've got to kill an animal. You've got to gut it. The animal has to basically be turned inside out. And the neck is the spout. Okay? So you take a goat, you kill the goat, cut its head off, take all its insides out, obviously eat the meat, and you got left with the skin, you got to turn the whole thing inside out, and the neck becomes the, the, the spout, and it has to be stretched and soaked for a long period, it has to be soaked for a long period of time and be stretched and prepared. Okay, and all of the tensions, most of the tension in the preparations at the neck. So that speaks of us. Long seasons of preparation, dryness, painfulness. Okay, much of it to do with our mindsets. Everything above from the neck up. Long seasons of preparation to receive the wine. Now listen to this, why go through a long season of preparation and then receive old wine when God's saying, I want you to have new wine? Because then the wineskin will crack and you have to start the cycle all over again. So listen to this, this is like a new wine. New wine is the power of the Spirit. It's now miracles. It's kingdom expansion. It's souls. Okay? In the 
in the southern and northern hemispheres on the earth today. There's quite a marked difference in lots of aspects of the body of Christ. And some of it goes back to the original outpouring of the spirit that happened in Azusa Street. Okay? Cut a long story short, the Azusa Street outpouring was an outpouring, probably the greatest outpouring since the day of Pentecost. And it led to a, a massive soul winning movement that began the Welsh revival that spread all over the world. There's a lot more I could say about that. But the, the people at Azusa Street, they waited on God. They waited on God. Intercession and prayer and worship was a massive part of who they were. They waited on the Lord for the outpouring of the new wine. They waited on the Lord for the outpouring of the new wine. They sought God in brokenness until that new wine was poured out. They didn't stop. And there was there was a man called Charles Parman, and there was I'm trying to think of some of the other names that totally eluded me now. Um, was the African American one-eyed black man? William Seymour. William Seymour. William Seymour and Charles Parman were the key people. I mean, this wasn't a time of immense racism. It was a very challenging time, and they that that movement waited on the Lord for the new wine to be poured out. They were broken before God. But there was opposition, and opposition arose from within. And part of the opposition that the enemy rose up was, you don't have to wait on God like that. Maybe there was excesses at times, I don't know. Just receive it by faith. You just receive the baptism of the Spirit now by faith. Just, bang, that's you receive it. Bang, you received it. And look, don't get me wrong, I'm not against faith. This is not an anti-faith. But it, the, the, it's receiving the new wine became something, just very quick and instant. And that influence spread to the AOG churches in North America and spread to Europe. And that's what we have today in the Northern Hemisphere. But the influence of Azusa, the waiting on God for the new wine, that went south into South America. Okay? And the churches in Africa have that. Where are the revivals in the world today? They're in the Southern Hemisphere. It's where there's a passion for prayer and intercession and a passion for souls. A passion for the presence of God where there's brokenness. Where, look, it's just normal for the church to pray and fast. It's normal. That would be abnormal in much of the UK. I think it's changing and there's a lot of prayer movements on. But it has been like that. The prayer and fasting and a heart for souls and expansion. This is for new wine. Because we've got to stay supple. The wineskin, our mindsets, if we're not on fire for God, the wineskin just reverts back to the old and it cracks. And we don't contain the move of God. And God is establishing a new order. Listen, old and new wineskins don't mix. Old mentalities don't mix. This is why, why it just is, okay? When people of polarizing different mentalities try to work together, it does not work. We believe in unity, amen. amen. We believe in unity in the spirit, amen. But if you try and make things of different polarity, it doesn't work. God cannot pour out his new wine into that. People have to be willing to change. There has to be a willingness to change. It's time for change. It's time to adopt new wine mindsets. It's time. I'm not saying let's rag everybody silly and, and, and live, live a life out of rest. Or live a life where I'm not being blessed. There's a lot of emphasis on me and my personal blessing. Amen. We need to be blessed. We need to be set free. But we need to live in the new wine. And God's going to set us up. And we're not going to be ashamed when we're around those people anymore. There's wineskins that are, are being eliminated by God. Because God wants to bring about a harmony and an agreement for the presence of God and for miracles. I'm, I'm really fortunate. I've seen God do a lot of miracles. And yes, I have seen the greatest miracles take place in Africa. I just have. 
kind of seeing we've seen miracles here in the UK and we thank God what I love about glorified church there's a, there's a hunger and there's a growing hunger we can't take it for granted miracles happen because there's a, a corporate culture created and within that there is an atmosphere for miracles there's an atmosphere for deliverance because there's an agreement and a harmony in the spirit. I'm telling you, some people, you can go into some situations and try and flow and lay hands on people and you get more reception off of this wood. Some people are made of copper, but when we create this together, you get the flow. Amen. Amen. Yep. We have a kingdom expansion mentality. Numbers 14 verse 24, we we'll finish here. This is, this is God speaking about Caleb. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring him to the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Out of all the people that left Egypt, out of all of the two million people that left Egypt, look at the church today, there's a lot of great teaching on blessing, amen? There's a lot of great teaching on prosperity and how we can come into the blessing. And we can come out of Egypt. Two million people came out of Egypt. It says not one was feeble amongst them. And they were full of silver and gold. And all but two of those two million people died in the wilderness and did not enter into the land. And the, the younger generation went in. We've got to pray. We've got to pray for the young generation. We've got to pray for the young generation. God's going to add a youth and a young generation here in Jesus' name. Amen. I said God's going to add a young generation. God's going to multiply a young generation and glorify a church who carry the supernatural power of God into their high schools, into their situations in Jesus' name. Not just kids who are intimidated and, and fearful because they're Christians, so they have to have their Christian kind of safety place with other nice Christian kids, but it's quite scary and have to hide themselves. But Christians, young people who are bold in the power of God, amen. Joshua and Caleb had a kingdom expansion mentality, right? The others saw themselves as grasshoppers. The, this part of the church in this country has a grasshopper mentality. And a grasshopper mentality, a grasshopper mentality equals death in the wilderness. Who wants to enter the land? Who wants to enter your inheritance? And yes, enter your blessing. Yeah. And I tell you, and as I say that, God, there's people here, God saying, I want you to own your own home. <laughs> I want you debt free. I want you in health. I want you. And that's your land. That's your territory. But God's also saying, I have an assignment for you. Oh, what's my calling in God? I need a special prophetic word to find my calling in God. There's a prophetic word. Stop praying. Develop your relationship with God. Pray when the church prays. Get the clothes, get clothed with the anointing of God so that as you penetrate your spheres, you're clothed, you're not naked and ashamed. And it will naturally happen that what you carry will get off onto them. And you'll be sharing the gospel. This lady has been testifying lately. What's been happening in your workplace? Just I've been sharing the gospel with colleagues. Sharing the gospel with colleagues. Yeah. Have you been Bible bashing them and come here, I've got a spirit? No. Why is it happening? Because you're free. Amen. 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 It's happening. And others here, we have. In the UK today, we could be intimidated and see ourselves as grasshoppers. And what we're against is giants. Joshua and Caleb had a kingdom expansion mentality. And they see it's the giants that are the grasshoppers. And we, we are the giants. Amen. We are the giants. And it's a time of war. I think, I, I don't know if I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Watch that movie, In Darkest Hour. It's a great movie. It's not a Christian movie, I know. About Churchill. When we were, we, we were facing war, we had a, a style of leadership in the UK at the time. Peace, peace, peace. Suing for peace. And Churchill went, no, there's no peace. Sorry. And he, people mocked him. People ridiculed him. And he said, look, when your head's inside the jaw of a tiger, you don't try and make peace with the thing. You have to, you have to get your head out and you have to fight it. You have to fight. Amen. Amen. Watch it. It's a great movie. Get yourself stirred up. We have to fight. 
And this is a fight that we're called to win. And we're going to win. Because it doesn't matter, you might think, well, here we are on a Sunday morning, there's only like four of us over in most, yeah. Look, we've got the Spirit of God, we've got the anointing. Who loves prayer? Who loves the Spirit of God? Who loves the presence of God? Then you are a giant. You are a giant. You are a giant. And if you're a giant, I stand on your feet, you're a giant. New wine, new mindsets, new wineskins. Hallelujah. I see a room for the supernatural evangelists. I see us having problems in Sunday services because there's too many testimonies. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to hear what God's doing in the, in the hearing Craig's testimony this morning? Wonderful testimony. But we have a problem. This is too many testimonies. Actually, we just have to have a testimony meeting. Because you are an anointed warrior. To start declaring it. I am. Holy Ghost filled. Holy Ghost filled. I am a minister. Of the Spirit of God. I'm filled with the Spirit. Now just receive right now. The new wine. And let's do away with this. There's been like a spirit. There's been like an attack upon us. We declare in the name of Jesus. I want every one of us here. Every one of us is called to be an evangelist of some sort. Say that's for me. That's for me. Now this week we've got to pray. We've got to be in prayer this week. We're not having people away next week sick. Amen in Jesus name. Hallelujah. We're going to have new visitors. New visitors. Hallelujah. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. Hallelujah. We take authority over every power of the enemy. We declare breakthrough in the spirit. We declare breakthrough in the spirit. We declare breakthrough in praise. Breakthrough in praise. Breakthrough in the spirit. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I have the new one. 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 Lord, make me. Make me a soul winner. A soul winner.